Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Zoom O'Clock with Tessie Anthony de Nassau and my wonderful, wonderful guest today, Olivia de Ramos. So Olivia and I go way back. Olivia and I, we met because she did an internship with me um, with, uh, yeah, a personal internship with my work, but also she came into my life at one of my darkest times, really, when I was going for my court case by myself as a litigant in person for my divorce. And Olivia was there day and night um, to help me with my court papers. And I remember we were printing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers and compiling them and putting them in bundles. And you, know, and you were just there when I was sad and, and frustrated and just really didn't know what's happening. And, uh, I want to thank you for that as well publicly because you have been such a strong force for me at that time and i know that at the same time you yourself went through something incredibly horrible if i may say yourself in your private life and we're going to talk about that as well in depth today about your story and how it has made you be what you are today and also do what you do today so welcome olivia thank you for having me i'm very excited to be here well it's such a pleasure to have you today especially today is my birthday and yes we do work on birthdays but uh, <laughs> i really wanted to do this zoom o'clock with you specifically today because um yeah our friendship is so wonderful and i'm so happy to see you again and that you're doing so well now so let's dive into the topic. So there's a topic which is not that celebratory and um, it is a reality to millions of women out there around the world. So your story, dear Olivia, please tell us a bit about you and the story that I am mentioning, but I wanna hear it from you. Please tell us about your path, what has happened and um, how how was that for you to experience this and where was the injustice okay so um let's see okay well it started in california i was a freshman in college and i was sexually assaulted um but the story really starts after that because i reported my assaulter i won two university tribunals um and despite that um, he sued me for defamation in court um, for millions of dollars. And um, it lasted for the majority of my adult life. It's over now, but it was going on while I was working with you, Tessie. And um, during that time, I couldn't talk about what was going on with me. I couldn't write in a journal. I couldn't um, access mental health professionals because anything that I wrote or said or did um, to anyone, you know, could have been used against me in court. And um, he really used the law in a um, extreme effort to silence me. And it was es essentially an extension um, of his abuse. Um, you know, you can't get over a car crash if it, hasn't if it hasn't stopped happening, is how I describe it. So, you know, it, what was originally a sexual assault, which is bad enough in itself, was extended into, you know, years of trauma while trying to um, get through university, you know, trying to start working, get out there in the workplace. Um, you know, all of these things became really difficult. And um, I kept waiting for the justice system, um, you know, in America to protect me because I had told the truth. So I thought, you know, they would say, you can't do this to her. This is unlawful. Um, but apparently that's, that's not a law. Like it's not a law in the United States that you can't sue your victim in an effort to silence her. And so what I found out through this process is that this is um, an increasingly popular tactic for wealthy abusers to silence their victims. And it's so effective, so nobody knows it's happening. Um, and I'm very lucky in that I could afford to defend myself. Um, you know, I spent upwards of $100,000 in legal fees. Most people in America or anywhere can't afford to defend themselves like that. And so they're often forced to sign gag orders. Um, and I really learned the hard way that 
freedom of speech is, you know, not the inherent right that they say it is. It's really seems to be, you know, only something reserved for wealthy white men in America, at least. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've gone on to do some pretty great professional stuff as a result of that, but that story is really kind of what's led me down, um, you know, the path that I am on today and trying to, you know, solve this problem or at least talk about it because so many people who experience it can't. Um, and I'm hoping to change the law at least, at least on a state basis, because I mean, Donald Trump's in power right now. I don't know what's happening on election day. Um, but I believe that even if he gets reelected um, on a state basis, at least in California, you know, there's potential for laws to change um, and all that stuff. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Wow, that's really, it's really terrible and it's crazy that, you know, and when you say it's, you know, your, your question to the system is freedom of speech really just for the wealthy has made yeah. me thought, has made me think because, you know, you and I know a little bit what I went through in court and, um, and, you know, without going into details about my story, but I do agree with you that, that people who have money, they just have more rights. They just get away with so many things and uh, use the desperation really of other people. Um, and also, as you say, the resource lack, the lack of resources to, to really get their way with gagging orders and other things. And I think it's just, uh, it really breaks my heart to hear that you needed to go through that, specifically in America, which praises itself with uh, the slogans, we are proud uh, to enforce freedom of speech for everyone. Um, so uh, so how, how then, um, when you were in court, you know, because I do remember as well that you needed to, you needed to face him. And, um, you know, and he was, uh, it was just absolutely, and I remember you really being, shattered at home you couldn't really work for me at, at all at, at the end and it, because you just said i am just physically unable to do it because yeah. you were completely burned out uh the candle on both sides and it was just you know um they forced you to still interact with him and uh how how was that for you and uh how did it feel at the end what happened at the end did that what came out at the end so um, I'm kind of limited in what I can say. Um, you know, I can say that the legal like process, you know, it's not like it was in suits. At first I was like, oh yeah, you know, I can defend myself. I'm in the right. I'm going to have these witty, you know, like Meghan Markle in suits, you know, she was always having those witty clapbacks, right? And I really thought it was going to be like that. Like I was going to, they might beat on me, but I I would be able to defend myself. You know, I'm sure you know, Tassie, that's not the case. You know, it, when you're, you're, I was, you, you know, you have to prepare for these depositions, you know, for months in advance. And you're constantly being questioned by your own lawyers because they're trying to prepare you for the horror of the other side deposing you. You know, where you're on camera and they can ask you anything they want, they can insinuate anything they want, they can insult you, <laughs> they can, um, you know, bring up anything, your sexual history, they can imply that you're, you know, um, I don't want to say any bad words, but they can imply that you're overly promiscuous. And I mean, really, really deeply hurtful things. Um, and you have to sit there and take it. You can't defend yourself. And you know, I don't, I, to this day, I don't understand why you can't defend yourself when you're in this position, but you can't. And so while, you know, I never had to directly speak to him, the, his, his very, very expensive and aggressive legal team did more than enough damage. And that was certainly the point. Um, and I want to say more, I'm just trying to figure out what I can, because, you know, I can talk about what happened to me in general terms, but, you know, um, I do have some limits, um, you know, I think for obvious reasons. Um, and, you know, I didn't have to, he was at, um, he, he was, as you know, he was asking for millions of dollars. I didn't have to exchange any money um, and it was resolved. But would I say that, I'm trying to figure out how I can phrase this and 
not get in trouble. Um, but yeah, it, it was resolved and I'll leave it at that for obvious reasons, but I wouldn't say that the court protected me. Um, and I, I hope that people can read through the, through the lines there, but I wasn't found in the wrong either is so I did. <laughs> as, so as you can tell, you know, I, again, I, I'm very lucky that I can talk about it at all, but there are some constraints. And I think that also speaks to, you know, this issue that we're talking about in that, you know, again, you know, I'm a very privileged person. And if I have constraints now, even though I didn't do anything wrong, you know, what would have happened to the many women who go, who, who go through this and don't have the privileges that I have? You know what I mean? I mean, they wouldn't be able to sit here and talk about it at all. So I can't really answer that question as much as I want to, um, but I, I hope that gives some insight at least. No, for sure. And it's really, it makes me almost angry that when, you know, just hearing this, that as a woman who went through all of this, that you are the one that still needs to be quiet, you know, that yeah. you are not allowed to talk about this, even though, as you said, and rightfully so, you were right. You were the victim and you were the one that this happened to. You didn't ask for this. And um, yeah, it's, it's shocking. And I leave it there because it makes me really angry. And it just, I have these, these films coming into my head of, of what happened to me in court, you know, um, which there was some crazy stuff like that as well. And yeah. uh, it's just, you know, it just makes me really sad because, you know, we, we trust into the system and yet the system accommodates to the few. Um, which, you know, sadly this is, let's leave it there, but this is sadly still what is happening in, in developed countries. So imagine yeah. how the women are feeling as well and how they are being treated and misabused and shamed really for someone else's bad actions um, in, in, in developing countries, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think your voice is really important and you have my full support. I think you're absolutely incredible. You're so inspirational. You're so strong. You came out so strong as well. So now moving on where you are now, because I am following you and guys, please do go and see, uh, Olivia's, uh, blog and her website and, and her publications. Um, so she is the founder of a new magazine. So can you tell us a little bit about your new adventure? What is it? Why did you create it? And um, what is it there to do? So I was really thinking about this kind of towards the tail end of um, my experience that I, you know, we just went into. And it was really when I realized that I couldn't find anyone to help me. I feel like that actually sounds so dark, but it was true. And I really had to get creative with how I was going to empower myself again, because the whole time I kept thinking the courts are going to re-empower me or someone would help me. I would find someone who could help me. And, you know, of course my parents wanted to help me. My lawyers wanted to help me, but they couldn't stop what was happening to me. Right. And, you know, there's, if someone isn't experiencing it, there's only so much that they can understand. Right. So I couldn't find any of that. I couldn't find support from a medical person. I couldn't su find support from friends. Cause again, you know, the more I told other people, the more danger I put themselves, them in and, and myself. So I was like, how can I get creative in, in feeling good again? And so I thought that maybe if I platformed other women's voices, um, because I think that a lot of the parts of my story are actually all of it are, are is extremely universal, then maybe I could speak through them and through platforming them and that maybe I would feel better by indirectly speaking through them because also I think that you don't realize how important being able to express yourself is until you lose that ability. And so, you know, it started off really small. It was really a, a desperate experiment at first. Um, it's caught on and it's, you know, we've had a lot of success. We, it's been a little over a year. Um, and so it's, it started as, you know, an online platform and it's really evolved because once we started getting progress, you know, my, my, the legal battle ended, um, you know, I was able to start really thinking about how, what I was doing was helping women and, and how, how I could actually 
best help women knowing what I, I know from my own experience. And so it was originally called Restless Magazine. Um, now we've kind of renamed Restless Network because we recently launched an app. And so we're still an online platform. We're still an online women's magazine, but I'm really excited about this app because, you know, it's never been about making a traditional media um, business. It's always been about, you know, how can I take my experience and make it something good come out of it and something helpful. And so what I realized is that, you know, women don't need me to be talking at them. Women need a place where they can talk to each other and, you know, support each other and, and share their experiences. Because, you know, I was originally taking it um, through article submissions and sharing them on the website. And I'm still doing that. But I'm really excited about this app that we have because they don't have to write an article. Um, they can just do it directly one-on-one -on -one in the community feeds. And it's this really, um, really cool um, kind of, I don't know what, what the word is that I would use, maybe um, holistic way of empowering each other because you don't have to have your story approved by a publication, a mainstream publication, or even Restless. You can just express yourself in real time and in real time have people support you um, back. And so it's really exciting. And um, you know, I'm I'm really excited to um, hopefully use my negative experience to create a business that's actually helpful to women. And so we're called Restless Network and it's very exciting. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. I will download the app today. I think it's so amazing how you have come around and you have always been a strong woman and you're just so positive always. Like even just talking, this is also the Olivia I remember. You were always smiling. You were always trying to do the best of everything. And uh, you just, oh, you're just such a delightful human being. So tell me, how can we listeners contribute other than to the app and how, where we can ex express our stories and where we can really, you know, say it as it is. But what else do you need? What else, what, where, what would be your biggest dream um, if you would have a magic wand? Well, my biggest dream right now is really growing the community on the app. We are almost at 10,000 users um, and that's on a super bare bones budget. So that's really exciting. Um, and the thing is the more, it's not all about numbers, right? It's about building the right community and a community that cares about each other. But the more people we have on the app that cares about the other users um, and the other members, you know, the more effective that community is. and the more life experiences we have to support, you know, the issues that anyone on the app is going through. So, you know, right now I would say on average, um, you know, the, we have a, a multitude of topic sections, but the one that's closest to my heart is the me too section. So on average, you know, if someone posts a problem that they're going through, they want advice on in the me too section, we have, you know, anywhere from five to you know 15 comments and they're great like paragraphs and they're really thoughtful and it's amazing but you know imagine when we have like 20,000 or a hundred thousand even like that those are gonna it's gonna explode and it's already so helpful but you know again it's just people finding out about us and you know again the right people the people who care and, and participating in this community, the more that happens, I think the more magical it's going to be. Um, and so it's really, you know, if, if people like what we're doing, the, the best thing to do is, you know, download the app, participate, share your life experiences um, with the other users. Um, because, you know, one person's, you know, experience is another person's roadmap to healing. And I really believe that. And I think that that's used in practice in the app all the time. So, yeah, sharing it on social media, t um, telling your friends about it. Um, yeah, the, my ask is very low. Just download the app and, and, and discuss with other people and, and tell people about us. <laughs> well, that is fantastic. I will make sure I put the link as well below your video and do send me it as well over WhatsApp, please. Yeah. So um, we have run over time already, way over time. It's just so fascinating and everything you have to contribute. So another last topic I want to leave you with, and I would like your advice specifically also for the platform, because I think the platform is also kind of, can also be used as a tool to inform our leaders and our institutional, institutional leaders and people who write policies and laws. 
So I think it's a very, very, very powerful tool you're having there. And it's so timely and it's so important. But with that in, in, in context then, you know, as we are going through the second lockdown now, in most of the countries around the world, uh, Corona is peaking again and it's really, it's, it's desperate times. For a lot of people, the economy is not well, socially we're not well, health-wise we're struggling. But one topic which often gets forgotten, among many, right, but one topic uh, is domestic violence. So domestic violence meaning that um, domestic violence has peaked. Uh, I have seen articles written in Luxembourg, so it has peaked in Luxembourg, which is a very developed country, right? So um, I'm sure in the US as well and in developing countries and all over the world. So where the woman is really mostly woman, men are also experiencing that, but mostly women are being stuck with their perpetrator and are just being abused and abused continuously because they can't leave. They need to stay there, right? So what would you like to see through your platform, through your work, through your story? What is your message? to policy writers, to lawmakers, to people who have the power to change something, to protect these human beings with your voice, what would you like to see and what is your message to them? Um, you know, I'm so glad you brought up this issue. Um, in the first lockdown, we had a writer talking about this exact um, problem. And she was talking about how um, the UK government did this whole social media campaign and that that's great, but there's no action behind it. And we don't want social media campaigns. Actually, we, we need action, right? We need specific policies in place. We need, you know, safe places for women to be able to go, you know, outreach programs we need um, it easy it to be easy for women to leave right and you know I think that so many governments not just the UK government the American government as well and you know the only two governments I can speak to are the American and British governments you know I now live in England um, but so many governments really expect like the nonprofit sector or the private sector to protect women and to supplement their failings and I think that that's a really terrible attitude to have when it comes to these issues it's their responsibility you know to protect the most vulnerable of, the, of our populations and i really just don't think that that's a priority for them it's ever really been a priority for them and i think that they really need to have an attitude shift and not just give themselves a pat on the back when they produce a viral media campaign and hey i run a media platform now so I know that media can be extremely effective, but I also know its limits, right? Because I mean, I see women on the app all the time talking about these kinds of issues and there's only, and there are things that restless can do to help, but there's only so much we can do because we aren't the government, right? We don't have the funding that they do. And I see us as hopefully, you know, a bomb to these many issues until the government really steps up to the plate. Um, so I really think that it comes down to action that I really don't see from them yet, um, from really most governments. Um, I'm trying to think of an exception. I, I don't have one. <laughs> no, you're right. Absolutely. Another, another topic that just came to my mind, which I think is really important as well, is, and it was uh, shared by a lot of care workers in the hospitals, for example, where people said, now for the second lockdown, it's enough clapping. We don't need clapping. We don't need... Mm -hmm campaigns, we don't need planes flying over with the national colors to say thank you to the NHS or other care workers. We need money, we need resources to accommodate what we need to take care of the sick. And, uh, you know, maybe if someone is listening who is working in that, you know, instead of clapping and putting a video on your social media that you're clapping for the NHS, taking the UK as an example, maybe each person who claps can donate an, a euro or a pound. I think that would go a long way. And I think that would be much more needed. Um, just to go with your point, you know, the words are great and the social media campaigns are fantastic to raise awareness, but there needs to be actions behind it attached as well. And I hope that as well to, for that topic on, you know, how to accommodate the sick, because we are going into the flu season as well. And Corona, you can get Corona while having the flu. So you can have the double illness. Um, and the hospitals are preparing. It's really terrible, right? Like in Luxembourg, my mom said yesterday she was in the hospital for an MRI. 
And uh, she said, you know, the hospitals, the psychiatry ward, for example, is now being built, considered to be built into um, spaces for the sick. And I think, you know, we really need to brace ourselves, but we also need the funding. So, uh, yeah. you know, that, that you know, as, as we said, you know, maybe instead of clapping, donate to your local hospitals um, because they need the money more than the clapping. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we leave it there because we could talk forever. I think you're just an amazing human being, Olivia, and I'm so blessed to have you in my life. Uh, we will talk offline definitely more. I will share the link of your platform, of your app, and your bio uh, for people to reach you as well. And I cannot thank you enough for uh, speaking up the way you do with such elegance and positivity and strength because millions of women need that. And you are doing exactly that. So thank you so much for the work you do to make a difference in, in the community you live in and around the world. Oh, thank you so much, Tessie. That's so Oh, such lovely things um, to hear. I really appreciate you having me. And, you know, in turn, I've learned so much from you and I'm such an admirer of you as well. And, and yeah, so lucky to have each other in our lives, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. So to more woman empowerment, woman with woman, and uh, we, we keep speaking offline. You definitely have my full support. And I'm sure a lot of people who have listened to this will come back to either you or me to wanting to hear more. So be ready for that. And uh, until we meet again, I send you much love, stay safe and healthy. And thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Tessie.